Francis, Dr. Mariam Al Abdullah, a specialist orthodontist. And this recording is for fifth year students to prepare you for our clinical sessions that will start soon. So just to uh, remind you of all bits and pieces that you need to be able to fill the orthodontic examination form. Before that, it's important to remind you with the uh, in intended learning outcomes, and these are the ILOs, and this uh, should be done for every course that you attend. Um, it will be provided as part of the syllabus in your e-learning uh, website. Right. So we all know uh, for any dental patient any, that you need to gather information uh, through talking to the patient and taking his personal information, chief complaint and other relevant uh, uh, information. And then you go with the clinical examination and then you analyze any necessary records like study models and radiographs. All these informations you gather in a specific, uh, let's say, form or a file, you analyze it. And then you come out with the proper diagnosis, problem list, and treatment plan. This is the form that you'll, you'll be working with uh, for the first and the second semester. Uh, it, uh, I think we have four or five pages. The first page is mainly for personal information, extraoral examination, intraoral examination, and occlusion. And then the second page is mainly for alignment and space condition. After that, you have the problem list and etiology. The third page is for treatment objectives and treatment plan. And then, as necessary, you could have your lab form for your removable appliance design or functional appliance design, for example. And then the cephalometric report. If you ordered a radiograph for the patient, you need to fill this. And then the space analysis form. So these are the forms included in your examination form. You need to get familiar with it. We're going to start with this one. And I'm not explaining in details how to examine the patient because you've already done this with two lectures during your fourth year uh, course. Uh, so you need to go back and read those uh, lectures. With regard to treatment plan, again, I think you took one or two lectures about treatment planning. You are a design again. You took couple of lectures, KEF analysis, you already took this um, in theory and in the lab in your fourth year, and space analysis as well. So as you could see, we're just reminding you uh, how to collect all these bits and pieces to be able to fill the form. So you have to go back, refresh your knowledge, and then be able to, to continue with this. The first part is the personal information, of course, and you have to go through patient's name, age, date of birth, chief complaint, you have to write this with the patient's own words because you have to address the patient's concerns. You need to know this because it will give you a clue about uh, their uh, level of compliance, uh, their expectations, and what uh, appliance they will accept, for example, treatment choices that they will uh, approve. So it's important to go with the chief complaint with the patient's own words, of course. Medical history is important. Uh, you just need to write down the relevant medical history, anything that is related to you. Dental history, again, like any dental patient, it's important to go with the regular attendance with the dentist, any previous extractions or root canal treatments, any previous orthodontic uh, treatment is very important because it will make you think, if you had previous orthodontic treatment, then why is this patient coming back seeking a new treatment? So there must be, for example, a poor compliance with retention, uh, 
let's say, incomplete uh, first stage treatment, etc. So it's important to write the dental history. So if the patient is a real patient, then this part here, the personal information you need to get by talking to the patient. If the case is a digital case, then usually these informations will be provided to you uh, on this, uh, through the slides, of course. Now we come to the extraoral examination. Extraoral examination, while the patient is in the natural head position, you look at the skeletal pattern, soft tissues, and habits. Skeletal pattern, we look at the anterior posterior, vertical, and transverse. Soft tissues and habits, you need to examine lips, swallowing pattern, habits, and timbermandibular joint, uh, which is the last thing uh, to check. Just to remind you, the skeletal pattern in the anterior posterior dimension, we look at A point, B point, soft tissue, of course. A point is the deepest concavity of the anterior surface of the maxilla. B point is the deepest concavity of the anterior surface of the mandible. And A point should be ahead of B point, two to three millimeter, to be able to say that this patient is having class one skeletal pattern. Please use Roman numbers when you, when you talk about skeletal classification. So this is a class one where the A point is ahead of B point, two to three millimeters. When the A point is ahead of B point more than three millimeters, this is class two, just simply class two, no subdivisions. Of course, you could, you could add later on with your experience, or if it's obvious, you could add mild, moderate, severe, but don't forget to, to use the Roman numbers. Class three is when a, a point is ahead of B point less than two millimeters, and sometimes they actually flush. Or sometimes B point is, is actually ahead of A point. Anyway, this is class three. In the anterior posterior dimension, this is an example. So we look at A point, B point, and this is class one. This is obviously class two, and this is class three. So in the skeletal pattern, in the AP, we write this first part of information. The second part is looking at the convexity of the face. The convexity of the face, we rely on three points. Glabella, which is a point between the eyebrows. Subnasali, which is the junction between the lower border of the nose and the upper lip. Subnasali and Pagonian. These three points are usually um, straight or are making mild convexity in class one cases, convex profile for class two cases, and usually concave profile for class three cases. So in the AP here, in this line, you just write class one or two or three, and then forward slash or comma, and then you add, you add something about the convexity of the face. Next is the vertical. The lower facial height. The lower facial height is supposed to be um, plus minus the same as the middle facial, facial height, so 50-50. This is the average. If it's more, we say that the lower facial height is increased. If it's less, then it is reduced. As simple as that. And the lower facial height is uh, measured from the subnasali to the menton. Mid facial height is from the glabella to the subnasali. So, for example, this patient here is having an average lower facial height. This patient here obviously is having an increased lower facial height. And if we compare the mid with the lower, this patient is having reduced lower facial height. In addition to the linear vertical measurement, we need to add a second piece of information related to the angular uh, vertical measurements. And this is the Frankfurt mandibular plane angle. Frankfurt plane is between the lower border of the orbit to the external auditory meatus. Extraorally, it is the lower border of the orbit and the upper part of the tragus here. So if we draw an imaginary line and then with our ruler or the back of our uh, mirror, we uh, we uh, look at the lower border of the mandible, uh, then these two lines should meet at the occipital area, here, the back of the head, at the occipital area. If they meet uh, anterior to this area, then this is an increased Frankfurt mandibular plane angle. 
If they meet posterior to the occipita, then this is a reduced Frankfurt multiple plane angle. Otherwise, if it's in this area, then it's average. And please use this abbreviation to make it easy for you to write in the examination form. So if we look, this is, of course, clinically, you cannot decide where is the lower border of the mandible uh, unless you use the ruler or the back of your mirror. If it's a photo, then you need to um, look at the radiograph to confirm the lower border of the mandible. So this is the lower border of the mandible. Let's say that this is Frankfurt plane. So if we draw both lines, they will meet at the occipita. So this is an average Frankfurt multiple plane angle. This lady here has um, ill-defined lower border of the mandible, but it looks like it's there. So if we take this line with the Frankfurt plane line, actually they will meet behind the occipita. So this is a reduced Frankfurt multiple plane angle. The slide here is having steep mandible. With the Frankfurt plane, they will meet just behind the ears, and this is anterior to occipital plane, so this is the, to the occipital area, so this is an increased Frankfurt multiple plane angle. Finally, we look at facial symmetry. There is no symmetrical face for sure, but there is something called acceptable facial symmetry, and there's something called, um, uh, let's say, um, an obvious asymmetry, like this case here, where the chin of this patient is pointing to the right. So we have facial asymmetry with the chin pointing to the right. Otherwise, if there is nothing obvious, then we go with an acceptable facial symmetry. So in the vertical here, as we said, we write something about the lower facial height, if it's average, increase or reduce, and then something about Frankfurt multiple plane angle. In the transverse, we just say acceptable facial symmetry or facial asymmetry, and then we need to uh, give some details about the asymmetry. Now we come to the lips. For the lips, we need to look at the morphology, thickness, competency, and distinct lower lip line, and we need to know something about swallowing. The upper lip, compared to the lower facial height, is plus minus one third. It's about one third of the lower facial height. So, for example, this patient here is having short upper lip. This patient here is having average upper lip, and this patient is having long upper lip, okay? If you look at lip competency while the patient is in the natural head position, at rest position, lips should meet at rest. Up to one to two millimeter of separation is considered still normal. So this is competent lips for this patient. This patient here, is having incompetent lips. This one here, incompetent lips. This one, incompetent. This lady is having competent lips. Then the last one is having incompetent lips. Frontal view, just to show you that the first line here on the uh, left are having competent lips, but the other one is, uh, the lips are thick and inverted. The lower one, although uh, competent lips, but uh, thin and strap-like. High tonicity. Here's incompetent lips with the lower lip line low, low lower lip line, and here we have incompetent lips. Here's incompetent lips with the lower lip acting behind the upper incisors. And I think we need to know something about the swallowing pattern. In this case, most probably the patient is having tongue to lower lip swallowing pattern. For patients with competent lips, and the overbite is complete, let's say, and the overjet is average, usually the patient will have a normal swallowing pattern, which is competent lip swallowing pattern. If the patient is having incompetent lips, but there is no obstacle to prevent them from coming uh, competent during swallowing, then the pattern of swallowing is incompetent lips forced together swallowing pattern. If the patient is having an anterior open bite, and we will come to this now in a minute, then that means that the patient will force his tongue forward to be able to get an anterior oral seal. So this is tongue to lips swallowing pattern. Finally, lower lip to tongue swallowing pattern like this case here. 
Of course, you have to write down any relevant habits like thumb sucking, nail biting, and then the temporal mandibular joint, you just ask the patient if there are any pains, uh, clicks, scripitus, tenderness, uh, previous uh, uh, accident, or problems with the temporal mandibular joint. So, this is finishing the extraoral examination, skeletal, soft tissue, temporal mandibular joint, and now we will come to the intraoral examination. For intraoral examination, like any dental patient, we start with the, uh, with the standards general, which is oral hygiene, tooth quality, caries risk, and teeth present. For teeth present, please use this numbering system. For permanent teeth, we divide the teeth into four quadrants, and we use the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the numbering system. Um, for deciduous teeth, A, B, C, D, E. And if you want to talk about a specific tooth, then use the palmar notation method, where you specify the quadrant and you specify the number accordingly. You need to uh, chart teeth present. So for example, if the canine is absent because it's impacted, for example, so you write here one, two, and then X, just to show that the canine is not there. Um, and then four or five, whatever the patient is having in his mouth. So in terms of uh, general oral uh, health and oral hygiene, we look at plaque accumulation, and we need to decide if the patient is having good, fair, or, or uh, poor oral hygiene. We need to look at any gingival recession, periodontal problems. And uh, regarding tooth quality, it's important to look at previous restorations, at the quality of previous restorations, uh, any temporary restorations, uh, hypoplasia, for example, any teeth with hypoplasia, this will affect the quality of teeth. Uh, teeth with active caries or badly destructed teeth, it's important to chart as well. Uh, hypoplasia uh, is also important. Uh, uh, again, any uh, uh, secondary caries, uh, you know, the the condition of existing caries is important to mention. Right, and then teeth present. So for example, if we look at this lower arch here, then you write down on your uh, form, seven in the lower uh, left quadrant, six, five, four, um, let's see, what's this? We can look at the OBG and find that it has a long root. So this is a three, this is a, an incisor, another incisor, and another three because of the length of the root. And then four, five, six, seven. So although when you first look at the photo, you think that all teeth are present seven to seven, but actually this is not the case. We have two missing incisors in the lower arch, two missing incisors. So we have four incisors and, uh, sorry, two incisors instead of four. Another example here, we look at the art and we start charting. So this is the lower left, seven, six, five, four, three. Obviously, this is the lateral, severely crowded and severely lingually displaced. This is the central, another central, another lateral, and then there is no canine. So we write down X on our chart, and then four, five, six, seven. And then if there is any, uh, ready grouse, then we look at it. For this patient, the canine, the lower right canine, is impacted, severely displaced with transosseous migration. Right? So it's important to chart teeth, uh, write them down, and any missing tooth, you just go with an X. So this is finishing the intraoral examination. Now we come to the occlusion. For the occlusion, of course, we need to mention. Uh, patients in size classification, over jet, over bite, molar relationship on the right and on the left, canine relationship on the right and on the left, and then cross bite and center line. For the incisors classification, it's the relationship between the lower incisal edge and the single and plateau of the upper incisors. If the lower incisal edge of the of the, uh, the lower incisal edge occludes at or immediately below the single and plateau of the upper central incisors, then this is a class one. If it's posterior to it with an increased over jet, then this is a class two division one. 
if it's uh, if the lower incisor edge occludes posterior to it with the upper incisors upright or retroclined, then this is class two, division two. If the lower incisor edge occludes anterior to the single plateau, then this is class three. So let's see at the upper photos, we have class two, division two, because the lower incisor edge occludes posterior to the single plateau of the upper centrals, and the upper centrals are retroclined. This photo here, the lower incisal edge occludes at the single plateau, so this is a class one incisal relationship. For the upper photos here, we have the lower incisors occludes anterior to the single plateau, so this is class three. The lower photos are showing the lower incisors occludes posterior to the single plateau with an increase over jet, so this is class two, division one. After that, you need to decide on the over jet. Is it average? Average is two to four millimeters. If it's more, then this is increased over jet. If it's less, then this is reduced over jet. The fourth option is to have a reversed over jet. So you need to decide if your over jet is average, reduced, or increased, or reversed. So for this patient, for example, this is an increased over jet, of course. Here is a reversed over jet. For the overbite, which is the vertical relationship between the upper and the lower incisors, the upper incisor should cover one third of the lower incisors, or the lower or the upper incisor it should lie within the middle third of the labial surface of the lower incisor. This is considered average. If the upper incisor cover more, then this is increased overbite. If it covers less, then this is reduced overbite. If it covers nothing, then this is the start of an open bite, right? So for the overbite, you need to write down number of uh, findings. Number one, is the overbite average, increased, or reduced? Number two, complete. Complete means the lower incisal edge comes to a stop during maximum intercuspation. This stop could be tooth structure or it could be soft tissue. For example, the lower incisal bites on the palate. In some severe cases, this is called complete overbite. So complete means that the lower incisor comes to a stop. So this is the second factor. The third thing that you need to write down is um, if uh, the overbite is traumatic or not. Traumatic when you have mobility, gingival recession, or uh, active ulcers on the palate. This is traumatic. So, for example, the, the, the photo on the right side is the average, where the upper incisors are covering one third of the lower. The one on the left is very deep. You, you hardly see any of the lower incisors. So this is deep or increased overbite. And the third one uh, here is um, reduced overbite. Uh, if there is no vertical overlap, then we write open bite. And again, if you decide that the patient had over by, uh, open bite, then you need to write down again three factors. Number one, um, how severe is the overbite, uh, the, sorry, the open bite? For example, here we have a two millimeters um, in the upper right, uh, upper left uh, central, four millimeters upper right central, and then another three maybe with the lateral. So you need to decide on the most severe uh, part of open bite. And here you write down four millimeters, for example. Number two, is the open bite symmetrical or asymmetrical? Okay, here is asymmetrical. And number three, it extends from where to where. And obviously here for this patient, the patient is having an impacted canine on the left side with retained C, in, um, partially erupted canine on the right side with a retained C, so most probably it's extending from C to C. Right. Molar relationship, of course, you already know. It's the relationship between the knees of buccal cusp of the upper molars and the buccal groove of the lower first molar. Here, the meso buccal cusp is occluding at the buccal groove, so this is a class one molar relationship. Here, it occludes anterior to it. So this is class two molar relationship. And since it's anterior to it, a whole unit, seven millimeters, a whole, the width of a premolar, then this is called full unit class two. If it's cusp to cusp, then it's half unit. And here we have uh, the uh, mesobuccal cusp of the upper molar occludes behind, posterior to the buccal groove of the lower uh, first molar. So this is class 
three molar relationship. For the canine relationship, the upper canine should occlude at the embrasure between the lower canine and first premolar. So this is class one. If it occludes anterior to it, then this is class two. For example, this is quarter unit class two. And here the canine is actually occluding a unit and a half behind the embrasure. And this is what we call one and a half unit class three canine relationship. Regarding the cross bite, you have to decide if the patient is having anterior or posterior cross bite. If it's anterior, you need to write down the teeth involved in the crossbite, and you need to decide if it's associated with mandibular displacement or not. For the posterior crossbite, you have to decide if it's unilateral or bilateral, localized or generalized, buccal crossbite or lingual crossbite, with or without mandibular displacement. So you need to answer these four questions. Let's take an example. Uh, uh, this patient is having uh, beautiful occlusion, no anterior crossbite, no posterior crossbite. This is a normal transverse relationship and anterior relationship. This patient here is having the lower buccal segment occluding lingual to the single to, to, to the sorry to the uh, central fossa of the upper buccal segment. So this is lingual crossbite. Another name is Scissor bite. This is the lower buccal segment occluding buccal to the central groove of the upper molar. So this is buccal crossbite. This is, of course, anterior crossbite. And there's some crossbite in the buccal segment, but this photo just to show you the anterior crossbite. Center line, you need to check upper center line first. Uh, in relation to the center line of the face. So here we look at the smiling extraoral photo, and we decide here that the upper center line is actually shifted to the right about one and a half millimeters. And then we look at the maximum intercuspation, the occlusion. And here we decide that the lower center line relative to the upper center line and to the center line of the face is actually correct. There is no deviation in the lower center line. So the first thing you do for center line, you decide on the upper center line first through the extraoral smiling photo, and then you locate and relate the lower center line accordingly. The second page in your examination is regarding the uh, alignment and space condition. Uh, so you need to mention something about crowding or spacing, uh, severely displaced teeth buccally or lingually, rotation, uh, and any other uh, findings that you didn't write in the previous page. We start with the lower labial segment, then lower buccal segment, upper labial segment, then upper buccal segment. For example, here in the upper labial segment, we say that we have severe crowding with the upper lateral incisors excluded from the arch and palatally displaced. By the way, this patient is having his teeth 7 to 7 with retained C. These are the canines, and these in the palate are the lateral incisors. Here we describe the labial segment uh, with severe crowding, the buccal segment moderate crowding. The labial segment, the upper left canine, is severely crowded and buccally displaced. The upper uh, right canine is buccally displaced, and the upper right five is palatally displaced with moderate crowding. So this is what you write down in your uh, form. So um, after you finish filling the first page and the second page, you come to your problem list and the etiology. It's important to understand and to know what is the normal, what's considered average, and then what's not considered an average, what is considered a problem. Anything that deviates from normal in your examination should be considered a problem. Anything that deviates from normal is a problem. So here you need to write down, if you do, if you, if you fill your examination form properly, then there is no, uh, you will have no issues in your problem list. You always start with non-orthodontic problems, for example, black accumulation, active caries, 
uh, residual case, whatever that is considered non-orthodontic problems, the gingival recession, periodontal problems, and then what the possible etiology factor there. Uh, and after that, we move to the skeletal. For example, the patient is having class two a skeletal pattern. We write it down. If the patient is having class one, we don't write it down. We just write what's deviating from normal. We just write what's considered not normal. Okay. And of course, regarding the etiology, you already had four lectures describing etiology of malocclusion in general, one on soft tissues, one on skeletal, and two on local factors. So this will help you to fill this part here. And we move on to soft tissues, for example, incompetent lips. Uh, and then uh, we move to dental, and most of the factors are usually dental, for example, increased overjet, uh, anterior open bite, uh, half unit class 2 molar relationship, anything that deviates from normal, you have to write it down. Right, after that, if you end up with, for example, five items on your problem list, then in the third page, you have to address all five items on your treatment objectives. So you have to address everything on your problems. When, when I say address, it doesn't mean to treat. No, sometimes accept. So for example, number one, we go back to our non-orthodontic problems. If you write down here active caries, then here you need to address this problem by saying restorations. Food diet uh, advice, for example, so that in the future the patient will not have the same problem. Number two, so let's go back. Number two, if the patient is having, uh, for example, class three, severe class three skeletal pattern, then you write here, correct class three skeletal pattern, because for example, you have in mind that you, you will be performing orthognathic surgery, for example. If the patient is having mild class three, then you could write here, accept, accept class three skeletal pattern, but you don't leave it out. So you have to address everything on your problem list in the same order. So it's easy for you to go non-orthodontic, skeletal, soft tissue, dental. So you don't forget any uh, uh, problem uh, item on your problem list. Okay. After you finish this, you should have an idea about your treatment plan. Do you need to extract to be able to apply and fulfill these, these uh, uh, treatment objectives or not? So extraction on extraction decision. Type of appliance simply, is it going to be fixed, functional, or removable? Plus, minus other appliances. Anchorage, do you need to reinforce your anchorage? Or no need to reinforce your anchorage if the system that you're using is, is good enough to uh, move teeth without losing anchorage? And then the buccal segment relationship at the end of the treatment. What is it going to be? Are you going to change it or uh, keep it? And then the retention at the end of the treatment. You will have a whole lecture on retention. In general, it could be no need for retention, short term, uh, short duration, or long duration. The appliance could be vacuum formed, Howley retainer, bonded retainer, or no need for retention at all. It depends, of course, on the case. So this is roughly how you will be able to fill your examination form. Please go back to the lectures that will help you to review this. Uh, and to be able to fill it. Um, every consultant might add uh, or remove some of the uh, details according to the case or according to uh, the way to go through the treatment plan. Thank you so much.